All right, so we're going to start with the last panel of the day. Um, it's a superstar panel, and they're going to talk about ending cannabis prohibition and access to psychedelic therapy by 2021. <laughs> You wanna, David, you wanna you, you present? Should, you should introduce me so I don't have to. All right, so, <laughs> so, who doesn't know David Brunner? <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, David, give a, a big round of applause for David. A, thanks to him and his camp and all his people who have been greatly foamed the whole week. And uh, he obviously has been a very important force to advance uh, psychedelics in cannabis and advance the policy and the research, and also more recently the indigenous issues around peyote conservation and others. So, just David, you can kick off the panel. Right on. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess briefly before, before I introduce uh, my other rock star panelists, um, yeah, I'm on the board of MAPS and, um, and was uh, one, of, one of the main forces organizing the speaker series here. Uh, it's just been like such an honor and pleasure to kind of bring together all the allies in my life that are doing the most important work on the planet, pretty much in my opinion, bringing these healing medicines through that can heal, uh, heal the trauma of, our, of uh, our brothers and sisters most in need, um, the depression, the addictions, like conditions that modern pharma and medicine are just scratching the surface of, they're totally inadequate. Um, and then also all of us uh, are, are in need of healing and, and accessing and healing and loving ourselves and each other and, and the miraculous living world we live in. So uh, it's, just, it's just a blessing to be part of this and help organize this and uh, feel like a portal's open for just incredible amount of downloads and truth to be shared. So it's been amazing. No. No. Mm. Uh, so, uh, Greg Boyd, uh, to my left, is uh, the rock star executive director of the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative, um, as well as New Approach. Uh, so, uh, it's the PSFC is uh, organizing philanthropists um, and raising firepower for key organizations and efforts in the, in, the, in the mission to integrate psychedelic therapy, working very closely with MAPS as we approach commercialization. Uh, bringing in different professional allies that can really help that process and working very closely with Rick and uh, the MAPS board uh, as, uh, as well as Joe Green who's the president and co-founder of PSFC um, and then also as the executive director and founder of New Approach he's raising most of the firepower uh, for ending cannabis prohibition he's been the architect of, of many of the state campaigns um, including or uh, Washington in 2012, Oregon in 2014, um, and then uh, a whole bunch in 2016, <laughs> including California. Um, and, uh, and, but even before that, he was the director of the Drug War Project at the ACLU. Um, and uh, it's just a really broad-based interest in any mass incarceration and drug and decrim and just advancing society in all kinds of ways. Um, and I actually first met Graham when he was arguing the, the Conan case, which was a key medical cannabis case early on in California, where the feds were arguing that doctors didn't even have the right to recommend cannabis as medicine, because it wasn't about prescribing, they're, but they were saying you couldn't even talk about it, you couldn't even say in your professional medical judgment, this is good medicine for your AIDS wasting syndrome or, or the, your nausea associated with chemotherapy. And Graham, I remember, because we were in parallel arguing DEA didn't have the right to eliminate or ban hemp, and so we were kind of going up side by side in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and I got to see Graham just rip to shreds, this DOJ attorney, <laughs> on, you know, just the, yeah. And it was just incredible, the, you know, that, that the, the First Amendment, free speech, the most sacrosanct area is the physician-patient, and the, the government does not intrude on that on you know, that relationship and that communication. And this is incredible to watch this. <laughs> and, and win it 3-0, you know, with Kaczynski, a very conservative judge. Um, and then Thomas Shree Eckert, uh, uh, super exciting new friends of mine. Um, they're the uh, husband, wife, co-petitioners of Oregon's uh, Psilocybin Therapy Service Initiative, uh, abbreviated PSI 2020. 
uh, therapists themselves uh, with deep experience facilitating psilocybin-assisted therapy, uh, just very intimately familiar with the healing power of this medicine, and have, uh, have long contemplated and are now deploying a, an incredible measure that um, will uh, address set and setting and optimize therapeutic outcomes uh, by licensing uh, uh, facilitators, screening applicants, uh, licensing grow ops, and uh, you know, a full legalization effort outside of the, the FDA medical model. Um, just super exciting. And uh, just, I think, is going to be triggering a huge national conversation. And I think it's going to win in a crushing victory. So just, <laughs> F, yeah. So FYI. Yeah. Uh, so I just, like, kind of to kick things off a bit, I wanted to, a couple of orientating metaphors from here, this series. So Rachel Yehuda, who's the head of the uh, Veterans Administration, Bronx uh, Veterans Administration, just a really high-level ally. Uh, also uh, involved with Mount Sinai's uh, leadership. Um, one of her men, it's just amazing to have somebody of her stature inside the VA um, be such an artic articulate and passionate proponent of MDMA therapy for trauma. She's intimately familiar. She's devoted her life to healing PTSD. She knows the total inadequacy of Prozac and Zoloft and the, and the different therapies we have. I mean, sometimes they work, um, a lot of times they don't. And, and she's just become a you know, just true believer uh, in the power of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. She understands it better than pretty much anybody and, uh, and just is able to articulate it. And one of her, her metaphors was um, processing the root cause of you know, the trauma, the root trauma, the, the super difficult emotions. It's like giving birth. It's like that, that, it's like that kind of a, it's a, it's a process that you know, our current therapeutic paradigm of like going in like once a week for like an hour, you know, to talk about stuff. Like this isn't, this isn't how you're gonna solve it. I mean, you need to go super deep in it. it it's like the body, mind, soul system is you're gonna be processing this in a really intensive, deep way. And you need like a long day, you know, like a long day, multiple days, you know, and, and I just really appreciated that metaphor. Um, I also wanted to share the, my insight that the, the MAPS logo with the hands kind of cultivate like around like source energy. I feel like that's the hands of everybody here. We're all like cosmic curlers. There's this massive source medicine energy coming through. And there's these different strategic ways we're just grooming the landscape for it to flow in and heal us. So, um, so uh, look, I'll just talk about some of the momentum that we're riding right now in psychedelic therapy, and Graham will talk about that as well as how we're going to end cannabis prohibition in 20 more states in 2020. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so uh, just some of the big uh, momentum riders is uh, the, obviously the incredible clinical research sponsored by MAPS and Hefter and Hopkins and NYU. That's, that's proving the just incredible power, healing power of psilocybin and MDMA for, for trauma and depression and addiction. Um, uh, then the politically, the political landscape that medical cannabis and adult use has really paved the way. And we're just really starting to shift the culture. Um, actually, I didn't write this down, but you know, also there is a broad based move on decriminalization, just the beginnings of it. You know, people are starting to realize that we can't arrest our way out of this problem. It's the criminalizing addiction, this is wrong. I mean, that's, we're in a process, uh, and, and, but that process has started. Um, ketamine clinics and therapy for depression, it's widespread. Uh, the FDA breakthrough status for MDMA and psilocybin. So Steve Ross was just sharing all the incredible work he's doing, but also the, just uh, support, the, the enthusiasm and the support within the FDA for these medicines and uh, just how, uh, yeah, that there's widespread recognition that these medicines and therapy are needed. And then Michael Pollan's uh, article and book, so first is cover story in New Yorker, the trip treatment was, I think, a cultural game changer. And then his book that dropped, um, I think, is it a year ago, uh, uh, How to Change Your Mind. It's just, you know, it's just amazing. And he's a perfect cultural crossover person to the mainstream. Um, and, that, and then the decrim nature campaigns in Denver and Oakland. Um, 
which uh, we were a little bit helpful in, in Denver. Um, and just, you know, just amazing to see that with very low budget campaigns win. So there's just a lot of, you know, generating a lot of national conversation. And then, yeah, and then the epidemics of depression, addiction, trauma that traditional farmer doesn't address. This is understood widely. All right, so, so what are the, the mechanisms of, of integrating these medicines and, and what are their pros and cons? So, of course, so MAPS, USONA, uh, so MAPS is, is, is primary project is moving MDMA through FDA approval process, so the FDA regulatory approval. Um, so that's, uh, MAPS is doing that with MDMA, USONA is doing that with psilocybin. There's also another entity, a for-profit entity called Compass that's also moving psilocybin through. And so the pros of that is that progress, you can make progress even when sti stigma, stigmatized by the drug war to the extent that was the case 20 years ago. So that, that we could actually, there is no way you're gonna win a ballot measure at all, uh, you know, even four years ago. But 20 years ago, Rick and Hefter and, and all these you know, leaders showed that you could work a system like all contrary intuition, they've been working it really hard and making incredible progress in a very difficult political climate. Um, and then through that work and through the amazing studies that have been permitted and licensed and then shown the incredible healing benefit, we started to destigmatize the cultural hysteria uh, with the safe medical use, that there is such a thing as safe medical use. Um, and then, of course, the uh, FDA approval, the breakthrough status, that's just huge. Uh, okay, and then also the therapy is optimized. These are like really like the optimized therapeutic, as far as we know, we're still refining what is the best therapy, but we've got a really good program. You know, it's uh, I guess nine sessions overall on the MDMA course, three with the medicine, uh, with psilocybin, a single session, but there's a pre and a post integration session and just a lot of just careful thinking and uh, has gone into that. Um, and once approved, the insurance will cover for the conditions that it's approved for. So for PTSD, you will, even if you're poor and indigent, insurance should cover it. I mean, that is a challenge, and Graham's working, and other working on how to make sure insurance will cover, but presumably they will cover it. Um, and uh, uh, you know, basically the best-in-class therapy will be covered for those conditions. Um, so the cons of the FDA approval process is, is, is it's not accessible without qualifying narrow medical diagnosis. So if you don't have the qualifying medical diagnosis, you can't access the therapy unless you get an off-label prescription. But if you get it off-label, it's likely you're not gonna have insurance cover that, which then opens up the whole problem of access. Like you're not, it's gonna be accessible for richer, more privileged people. Um, so, I mean, it's still hugely important, obviously, to break through, but this is, you know, one of the, one of the problems of uh, the FDA route. Um, but, I mean, over time we will do the studies that enable more and more qualifying conditions to be covered by insurance via the FDA route. Um, and then there's a therapy training bottleneck. We're working that out. But, you know, there's basically a huge population of suffering people and the therapy is so key and how do you get the quality of the therapist and the therapy and scale that so they can meet the huge demand and need, but not compromise the quality of the therapy. So, um, okay, so now the other major route is the decrim campaigns. So these are now and ongoing. So the FDA route 2021 for MDMA, 2023 for psilocybin is what it looks likely. Um, decrim campaigns are happening now. We just won Oakland and, 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 uh, and Denver. Um, the pros, um, it's cognitive liberty. We all have a right to explore and expand consciousness and heal our hearts and minds however we want. Um, you know, we're free to use at dead shows in nature, at home, other awesome settings, you know, however you want. You know, and, and, and obviously the therapeutic context is ideal for qualifying conditions, but I mean, we all know that a dead show, you know, when they're in the super jam is like shamanic, deep trance, what healing on the mega level. So, you know, and that's obviously not accessible via the FDA route, um, you know. <laughs> so, uh, 
you know, but and it is destigmatizing de the overall situation. Like culturally, it's just generating conversation and momentum. And you won't be arrested if you if you possess the medicine. That's important. Uh, okay, the cons is that it's not legalization. You, it's still illegal to grow mushrooms or uh, or sell them. So it's not a uh, it's not a it's very insufficient. Um, the purity and quality of the medicine is a problem. Okay, it doesn't optimize set and setting for these really strong, powerful medicines, especially the amazing therapeutic models we find in the MDMA and psilocybin studies. Um, there's a lot, these are very, very powerful medicines, and to be able to use them, in, especially if you are suffering from trauma and depression, um, you know, how do you go about that? And these decrim, it's just kind of a little bit of a free-for-all. So, I mean, obviously we wanna promote optimal therapeutic context and set and setting, and, Decrim doesn't do that. Um, and also sustainable sourcing of medicines is not addressed. So we just heard about Izzy just commenting that the concern of the Native American church around peyote. Okay, so Oakland just decrim peyote. Well, we already have a massive overharvesting problem of the peyote gardens in Texas. Um, you know, the, the, so just decrimming, okay, now you can have peyote. It's not addressing some really core problems. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, just briefly also, um, the somewhat narrow, but Congressional Supreme Court religious protections for, for ayahuasca, for uh, the UDI, I forget exactly how to pronounce, the, the church that has legal protection to uh, Unio de Vegetal, to, yeah, UDV, okay. So UDV, they, you know, they can use ayahuasca within a religious context. Uh, and, um, and then, of course, peyote within Native American tribes. Um, but it's limited to those populations and suffering people and people in general otherwise can't access. Okay, so then here's my, I'm very excited by all of these, but I'm now getting really, really excited about organ psilocybin therapy measure. And I'll summarize that briefly and then turn over to Graham. So, uh, and, and Tom and Shri. Uh, so, organs, uh, so the pros here is, so they're, what they're contemplating is a licensing of therapists and screening of applicants outside of a strictly medical setting. So you don't have to have a qualifying medical diagnosis to access the therapy. It's kind of a psychotherapeutic model. Um, so addresses set and setting and optimizes the therapeutic context for these powerful medicines through training and licensing facilitators following best practices pioneered in research studies. Um, and screening for applicants and contraindications. I'll just say right here, it's not, you know, there, there is a, a legitimate concern within the research community that, you know, what exactly, how, just how well trained will these therapists be, but it addresses uh, the, I think, most pr uh, problematic aspects of, of decrim, and basically is allowing the underground community of a lot of experienced practitioners with long, histories of working with these medicines, which have been worked with in indigenous contexts for thousands of years to come above ground. Um, so and it legalizes the production and selling and delivery of the medicine. It's not just a you know, decrim possession. Uh, sustainability and quality of the medicine are addressed. It controls for the big cannabis scenario through limiting the size of the grows. In partnership and deference with DPA, uh, Drug Policy Alliance, hopefully there will be also a broad-based decrim campaign not just mushrooms, that's one of the critiques of decrim, I forgot to note, is decrimming much, it's like, decrim is really, we talk about a societal good, we're talking about any mass incarceration, particularly for people of color who are most disproportionately targeted, and mushrooms is really not the problem. It's really, it's a, it's a broad-based drug policy approach, and decrim, we wanna have that fight ideally in a, in a broad, in, in the decrim frame, not in the psychedelic therapy frame. Um, and which we are hopefully going to see in Oregon and maybe Washington. Um, so uh, no pressure on over har harvesting like in the peyote gardens, uh, much more affordable access to the medicine therapy. Uh, not necessarily still super cheap, but way more affordable. Uh, don't need a medical diagnosis, um, you know, so everybody can access. And just I wanted to comment on Steve, Steve Ross, is uh, the, the lead researcher for many amazing psilocybin studies uh, being conducted for, for alcoholism, for depression, 
Um, and then most exciting for, well, those are all very exciting, but religious professionals. So he was explaining the Good Friday experiment back in 1962 where, where Harvard Divinity students were fed half of a control sample were fed psilocybin, half were controlled niacin, uh, and then uh, we're in a Good Friday service, and um, the divinity students who got into psilocybin all had mind-blowing, heart-blowing, mystical experiences. Pretty much nobody, obviously, who got the niacin did. Um, and Rick Doblin uh, did a 25-year follow-up for his dissertation, followed up with all the participants, and documented that they were all, everyone who got on the south side was basically uh, rock in life and, and, and said that that experience was one of the top spiritual experiences of their life. Um, so to have that come back now and to have the FDA approve uh, a study, not for like a medical diagnosis, but for just normal healthy people is so exciting. Um, and one of them that almost got happened is a, is a prison, like working with prisoners in Alabama, which is the con, another, early study back in the 60s, the Concord <clears throat> prison experiment Leary was doing with showing how you could just really reduce recidivism uh, by uh, L LSD therapy, which Rick also then went ahead and did a follow-up and showed was a little dubious and optimistic in some of his conclusions. But nonetheless, uh, uh, having uh, MDMA and psilocybin therapy inside our pr prisons is, is managed, along with all of our po politicians in DC, it will be great. Uh, and um, all right, but anyway, so Oregon is like, so along with that pioneering religious professional study, the Oregon measure is really opening it up to the, everybody that needs this healing. Um, okay, and it's going to trigger a, nas a huge national conversation and set the example for responsible adult access to this therapy. And a crushing victory is likely since so tight in the therapeutic frame without, diver without any diversion for take home use, diversion of minors, or drug driving some of the traditional opposition to like the cannabis measures, they're all controlled for. It's in the therapeutic frame. I'm predicting 60% plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> all right, um, two year delay. So Graham is really nuts. And I guess Thomas Shree are just amazing, blending heart, mind, and soul and crafting a very strategic measure and working great partnership with the larger movement concerns to refine and optimize. Graham in particular has been kind of channeling a lot of the researcher concern and it's just been, it, it has been redrafted and has now just been refined and it's just beautiful. Paul Sam, it's just incredibly excited. It's just amazing. Um, there's a two year delay if the implementation to kind of allow that national conversation to mature and result in an actual viable program. Okay, so but the cons is unlike decrim, you can't have and use however you would like, so you can't have it at the dead show. Uh, but hopefully DPA's broad-based decrim is going to solve that problem. Uh, from the researcher community, some concerns this will trigger FDA or cultural backlash that, oh, you're going too far too fast. Um, but, you know, it was nice hearing, talking to Steve, who's pretty much the top researcher to conducting the most studies of any single researcher. Uh, I mean, a lot of other top researchers, if anyone is here. Uh, but. Uh, but anyways, it was just great talking. You know, he, he just feels 100% confident that we have way too much momentum. There, it's overblown to concerns of that kind of backlash or, or problem that, and anyways, like the measure is such in a tight therapeutic frame that the conversation, the only way this would lose is that, oh, we approve medicines via FDA process. It'll be like a process. It won't be, uh, I mean, it'll be like a process to feed is my, is my take. And it won't trigger anything like, uh, I don't know, LSD, you're jumping out of windows, all that kind of thing. Okay, um, and, uh, and then insurance won't cover, but, and that's, you know, that's just part of it, but um, it is much cheaper in this, in this model. Um, so, all right, so that's, uh, uh, I just wrote this up all like right before I got up here, it was long. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'll turn over to Graham here to, to take it away. Thanks, David. What's a time check? Do you have the time here? Uh, oh, I just used a half hour time, man. 29, 17, 29. It is a beautiful use of, of a half hour. Thank you. So, um, hi, everybody. I'm Graham Boyd, and thanks, David, for that nice introduction. I, I was thinking about, you know, what are, what are we doing here with this panel? And there have been now a bunch of days and dozens of speakers, and everyone is basically 
describing a world that we want to live in, a future that we yearn for, one that kind of exists on the playa, but when we go back home, it, 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 it only exists in pockets of privilege, right? Where, where we might be able to do what we want to do around substances that are illegal. But for most people, it, it doesn't exist as an option. And if you do explore as an option, you might end up in prison. So that's, that is not the world we want to live in. So this is the panel about how do we get from where we are right now to that dream that we've articulated over a number of days. How do you change policy to make that difference. And so I, I, I'm going to put on my, um, oh, and one of the things you didn't mention in introducing me is I'm the political director for Dr. Bronner's. I think that's the hat that I'm most excited about. <laughs> Very proud of that. Um, but I'm going to put on my lawyer hat for a minute and just talk about, you know, I mean, David threw out a lot of sort of policy options and pros and cons, but how do you actually get there? So I, I'm, I'm going to, th this will be like a quick five minute law school seminar. So, so hang on to your, you know, on, on to your hats here. Um, federal law criminalizes all of the drugs we're talking about, right? So if you use or grow or manufacture or sell or give away any of the drugs from cannabis to cocaine to heroin to uh, the different psychedelic drugs, it's all a really serious crime under federal law. And every single state copies that law. And this stuff is actually pretty recent. It was under President Nixon that the Controlled Substances Act was introduced, and it was sort of a backlash against the 60s, you know, psychedelic, Timothy Leary. It really scared it. It scared the conservatives, and they were like, we got to clamp down on this. So federal law makes it all a crime, and then each state copies that and makes it a crime. But what's interesting is drug law enforcement is almost entirely by state and local police. So the federal police, the DEA, is actually a tiny little police force. It's a much smaller police force than, you know, for the whole nation than exists in most cities. So the the day-to-day the -day work of drug law enforcement is done by the local cops, by the state highway patrol, and most of those prisoners are in the state prisons. The, the federal government focuses on high-level you know, basically drug enterprises or something that's going to have a really big impact in their view. So that, that's part of the architecture. So how do you change that? Well, you could start at the top and try to change the laws at the federal level at Congress, but that's a complete non-starter and it has been for a long time. The politics of, of sort of the moralism of drugs are bad, it sends the wrong message to kids. I mean, the, you, you can't even get you know, one inch down the road in terms of changing the drug laws overall in Congress. At the state level, it's also hard. Most of state laws are changed through the state legislature. So again, the people who are elected to the legislature, they're, they're scared. They're not, there's not a huge con constituency saying, I'm going to vote for your reelection if you legalize drugs. But there are a lot of people who will vote against them if they take that stand. So most politicians, and, and starting to change, but most politicians see that as an impossible route. So change has come over the last decade through ballot initiatives. And about half of the states have a mechanism that if the legislature can't do its job and pass a law that needs to be passed, the people can do it directly. So you've got to get a lot of signatures. It's usually about 10% of the people who voted in the last election have to sign a petition. And that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, to collect those signatures, depending on the size of the state. Uh, so it's not easy to get on the ballot. Then once you're on the ballot, it'll be on election day, all the voters in that state, in California or in Oregon, get a chance to basically say yes or no to this new law that would be written. So that's how the, the cannabis laws have changed. And interestingly, there were five attempts to change the cannabis laws at the state level through ballot initiatives, and they all failed prior to, whoop, prior to 2012. What happened in 2010 is a group of people got together and really studied deeply how ordinary voters think about cannabis, right? And it's really different than how we think about it. That was the mistake that a lot of the campaigns had made before. It's like, let's talk to our friends and we know the arguments that we all love, and then let's try to convince everybody to agree with us. And it didn't work. 
And so we, trying to meet voters where they are, it requires a lot of research, focus groups and polls and, and ending up filming ads. And, and, and it, you know, it's kind of a bummer at one level, but it's also nice to, to win. So the first ad that we filmed and the first successful legalization campaign was a about 40-year-old white mom sitting in a coffee shop in, in Washington State, and she's sipping a cup of coffee, and she looks up at the camera and she says, it's not that I like marijuana, but what we're doing now isn't working. What if we tried something different? Like, we could tax it and we could regulate it. So it, it's basically like, okay, voters, a lot of you really actually don't like marijuana. You're scared of it, but you know that what we're doing now is no good. So that was like one of the paradigm shifts that allowed us to talk to voters successfully beginning in 2012. The other thing we did is we sort of blended activism with professionalism. So we hired, you know, basically mercenary consultants who run campaigns on any issue that you could choose. They charge a fair amount of money, but they're pros. They do the polling, they make TV ads, they target it, and, and so you're not gonna, in a lot of ways, activists, but I mean, myself, I'd like to be talking to sort of my people, but you know what? They're already gonna vote yes. You don't need to talk to them. You need to talk to the people who are on the fence who might vote no. You also don't need to talk to the people who are definitely gonna vote no, because you're not gonna convince them. So you gotta know who to talk to and you gotta target it. So anyway, very professionalized. And now we've had a string of one win after another by putting together campaigns on cannabis with that kind of playbook. And the only losses that have existed around cannabis have been where there's been an overreach. So in Ohio, some really greedy people put together a law that basically said, once we legalize cannabis, you can only grow it on these 12 plots of land. And guess what? They own those 12 plots of land. So it was like self-enriching, monopoly, terrible idea. And I'm glad it lost, right? Although I'm sad in a certain sense because in Ohio, people still get arrested, right? So those guys really overreached and blew it. But, if you, but I believe now if you do it right, at least in a politically progressive state, you can win. And now we've done that 10 times. The hard thing is, is the states that are left to legalize cannabis and that have this direct democracy ballot initiative are all quite conservative states. They're places like Mississippi, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Montana, uh, Missouri, Utah. Ugh. <laughs> and so I've done a bunch of polling over the last couple of months and to my complete shock and delight, cannabis reform is now viable in a number of those states that I just listed. And we're kind of keeping it on the down right now. But but you're going to see over the next year the launching of campaigns, one that we have filed so I can mention is South Dakota, but you're gonna see the launching of legalization campaigns in a bunch of states where nobody thought that that was possible. And we're doing medical cannabis in Mississippi, Idaho, and Nebraska. I mean, those are about the most conservative states there are. So if we, Oklahoma already has medical, um, but we're, uh, we may or may not be looking at legalization there. Stay tuned. <laughs> but if we, if we manage to pull this off over the next year and a half and on election day in 2020, legalize in all of these states, then the game is over because you've got a bunch of Republican senators and Republican members of Congress who have constituents that are running businesses that are legally doing this and they're gonna to wanna to change federal law. So my prediction is that federal law is not gonna change, but, I, but if we win these state ballot initiatives, then the dominoes just start falling. Um, more states legalize through the legislature and then the federal government does so too. So turning now to psychedelics. Psychedelics is, is in this interesting state, and David did a really great job of describing this, where you've got this slow, steady progress that MAPS and Hefter and USONA and, and you know, the research scientists at NYU and Johns Hopkins have been building this beautiful building. It looks like the temple out on the playa, you know, one board after the other over 20 years, and it's nearing completion that the FDA is quite possibly going to say yes. And this is like, this is a, is a renaissance because that track was happening back in the 1950s and 60s. 
but because of sort of the overreach of like, psychedelics are awesome, everybody should use them, you know, Timothy Leary, all of that. The cultural resistance to that um, caused the laws to change, caused the research to shut down, and it was all over for an entire generation. So it is scary. I mean, I, I, I have to say, when I first heard of your lovely initiative, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't do ballot initiatives. Don't do these decrim measures. Let this beautiful building that MAPS and Hefter and USONA are building, let that be completed, and then we can go the next step. But then I realized it's happening anyway. Um, and then I decided to actually talk to the people who are doing it. And it turns out they're lovely, and they're smart, and they're strategic. And there really is a pathway forward, I now believe, that is dual track where the medical approval is going to happen, but at the same time, we're paying attention to what happens outside of the medical framework. So I, I said when you were sitting down, I wanted you to talk to your neighbor about what the ideal psilocybin policy would look like. And you're, gonna, you're about to hear from two people who are gonna give you their vision of what the ideal policy would look like, but I'm gonna take just two minutes, and then I'll be done, where I'm gonna come out into the audience. If you've seen me do speaking before, I can't help but do that. And so I, I want you to raise your hand if you talked to your neighbor and told your neighbor what the ideal psilocybin policy would be. And then I'd like to actually hear from your neighbor what you heard. And if that didn't really happen, you can tell me what you think. But very brief, I'm going to hold on to the microphone. We're going to go through this. But what are the elements of like the really perfect psilocybin policy? So can I see a hand? Oh, come on, people. You can do this. Yeah, go ahead. Try not to step on anybody. Thank you. OK, so first off, um, I think compassion is probably the biggest um, overarching principle that we can pay attention to, um, loving presence um, in therapeutic settings, um, being able to offer support to people who are underserved is a huge um, part of it because, like you said, um, pockets of privilege um, where you can, you know, do as you wish is a big element that we need to overcome so that it bridges the gap to all parts of society. Um, that's good to get to other people. So, so, um, so what you're focusing on is, the, is, is sort of the therapeutic, quasi-medical, but therapeutic sort of setting for psilocybin and wanting to have access for everyone for that. What's something else? Let's don't repeat anything that's been said. Somebody else raise your hand. I don't know. Something that just came to mind was um, we get certified to be able to jump off a plane by ourselves, right? And we get certified to do certain other activities, um, to drive, for example, to get a, a license for that. Um, I believe if we designed a sort of um, training, because for me, plant medicine is all about tapping into the wisdom within, right? To being our, our own highest teacher. And if we created a course where we talk to people about set and setting and about setting an intention and about safe practices so that they can get a certificate that says, you know what, I learned the basics of what I need to learn to do this from a heart-centered uh, place and uh, an intentional uh, conscious effort to expand my consciousness and to heal my trauma, I believe that can help us at least make people, uh, at least help people that don't understand it feel safe in, in their, with their own judgments, feel safe that people are receiving some kind of instruction on how to do this in a safe uh, way. I, I love that, and I haven't heard it before. This is really, you, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it, in some ways this is uh, an awkward analogy, but, you know, in, in a sane world, you could only own a gun if you had a license, right? And so what, what if, you, if you had to get like licensed to be a you know, certified psychedelic user on your own? I can imagine some pushback from that, but it's an interesting idea. So who wants to see retail outlets? Who wants to see billboards and TV ads saying, use psilocybin, it's great? Yeah, uh, uh, there, there's some there's some sentiment for that. That's that's totally cool. Do you want to do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to get psilocybin uh, next to the shiitake and the portobello at Ralph's. It'd be it'd be awesome. Yeah. So so who's scared of that? Who's scared of that? 
the, the psilocybin next to the shiitake. So this is a tough issue, isn't it, right? I mean, if you, if we want a world where there's real access, where David can go to a dead show and, you know, mega next level experience, but the person who has had some recent psychotic breaks and maybe is susceptible to schizophrenia and goes to Ralph and picks up a big hand of mushrooms, that scares me, but then that's true of alcohol. Too. Anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a big, huge argument with myself about this. Okay, I don't wanna go deeper on that one point, okay? I want a different idea, and if you've got a different idea, then I'm going to really love to hear that. Thank you, I've come to this from an addiction standpoint because I'm an addiction therapist, and I would just like to say that on top of certification, specialized, specialized trainings for licensed therapists who want to do psychedelic therapy, I'd also like to see um, legalization of all substances because I don't believe that incarceration is a solution for addiction to any substance. Yeah, Thank, thanks so much for saying that. I mean, it's, I feel like in this room it's almost like the obvious point, but like whatever policies we work out, one of the policy tools should not be handcuffs. One of the policy tools should not be prison bars, right? There are other ways to incentivize people to do what it is that we as a society deem appropriate or not. We're smart about that. We do it around other things. But it's only, well, a few other things too, but around drugs we use those tools. So I want to give Tom and Cherie enough time. I know others of you had things to say too, but I really appreciate the creativity coming out of the crowd. And, um, and let me just say this, I think that you know, the, the, the last distinction I want to draw, and David touched on this too, and then I, am, I really am going to give you the mic, is the decrim model and the therapeutic model. So as you listen to Tom and Cherie, keep in mind that there is bubbling up this big movement at a local level to make the local police stop arresting people for use of psilocybin or for other psychedelic substances. That's a step in the right direction, but honestly, it's mostly symbolic. And the jurisdictions where the voters favor that are the very jurisdictions where the police tend not to do it. So I think it's good, and with cannabis, that was part of the early uh, movement too, was, were these sort of symbolic local initiatives. But the risk of taking that to the state level is that you pick off the easiest drugs. Let's, let's decriminalize or even legalize psilocybin at the state level, and you do that with a couple of the other drugs that are sort of more popular. There is no way then that you're ever going to bring along methamphetamine or heroin or cocaine because of the stigma associated with that. And then we're leaving behind our brothers and sisters who are getting arrested and incarcerated for that. So I believe strongly that we need a two-track approach of what you folks are up to and at the same time looking to decriminalize all drugs at a state level, and we're really throwing in behind Oregon and Washington trying to do that in 2022. So thank you so much for being here on a, on a, a five o'clock when you could be out on the playa doing all kinds of crazy stuff. It's really inspiring to see you all. Tom and Cherie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you for all the time you've invested in this particular initiative, in Tom and I, helping us to understand even in a more profound way the great global work that's transpiring right now in this moment. And I think that it's much bigger than we can imagine and much more beautiful than we can also imagine. So thank you both. Thank you for your expertise. And thank you guys for, like they said, coming and, and being willing to listen to what we propose. <laughs> So we should probably jump in. We don't have too much time. It's, it's going to be hard to get to everything, and there's so much good nuance in this. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, if you guys are willing to hang out, there's a lot of nuance uh, to. <laughs> yeah, if it's good enough for Rick. <laughs> right on. So let, let's tell the story a little bit. So. Um, 2015-ish, we um, were, we actually read the trip treatment, which you referenced, was Michael Pollan article that was uh, before his book that came out that had such an incredible influence. Now, I'd kind of, we had a, a, a little bit of a, a sense of the research progressing in psychedelics. We certainly had our own experiences with psychedelics that dialed us into the healing properties. Um, going back, for me, going back to school uh, back in the 90s when I was studying uh, to 
uh, studying clinical psychology in graduate school. Um, and I can trace my, my, my thoughts on this to then, because back in school, this, back in the 90s, uh, pharma had kind of started to take over the therapeutic enterprise, and that hasn't really changed. The medical doctors are kind of the top dogs. And then in, in studying psychotherapy, um, that kind of fell under the medical model as well. So it was all about diagnoses and differential diagnoses and targeted treatment protocols, dealing with insurance and doing things their way, basically. And it was very disillusioning for me. And so I just give that as a backdrop. Fast forward to 2015, we start cluing into psychedelics. And, well, one more thing about back when I was in school, I studied, uh, in, all the models didn't make a lot of sense to me, um, but the humanistic kind of existential approach kind of did, because it put the power of healing inside of you, and it put the role of the therapist as a facilitator, as a, someone who could clarify and reflect and, and help somebody to find themselves, but the client themselves did the healing work, and there is an art to facilitating that, but it's very profound philosophical difference. The medical model uh, comes from a place where the intervention comes from the outside, the doctor is kind of given the healing power somehow, and we have to kind of go in that direction. So it's actually a pretty important philosophical point, and it fits into the psychedelic modality. So now, jumping to 2015, I think you we're kind of on that same track in terms of the, the philosophical yeah, we thinking are. behind Although I have a very, very different background than Tom, I actually, ha until in my early to mid-50s, never had done psychedelics. And so for me, I was kind of, I had a mom who was caught up in the 60s, and as a result, um, really didn't make it. She died when she was 55, and it wasn't because of the 60s, but she was a wounded bird, and she didn't have what she needed. So I watched her use drugs in such a way, like uh, the girl who came up here and was speaking about the queer dome. She had her partner who used LSD and then died. I had this experience, and I went the other way. And so, very conservative modality, um, very spiritual. I, I'm a graduate of seminary. However, I was scared of psychedelics. I'm the mom in the coffee shop, actually, right? But then I met my husband. And then Michael Pollan wrote Trip Treatment. And I was able to see that I already had this spirit-oriented way of therapy with my clients. And I was able to see this is what we need. This is what we need. It's not a panacea but it's something that opens us up in a different way than just talk therapy alone. And I think of all, how many of you in this room, by the way, are or know somebody, family, friends, or work associates who are struggling with addiction and or depression? Yeah, right? We know this, everybody. That was literally nearly everyone in the room. And, and, and as therapists, it's sad to sit with people day after day after day when we know that there's something out there that could possibly help them and they wouldn't have to come back for 10, 15, 20 years. They'd have the hallelujah experience and not everybody does, but for those who have that mystical experience, it's lasting. So Tom and I... I, I think that key element is the experience. So the revolutionary aspect of this and the way that it falls outside of the typical medical paradigm it's kind of obvious, but reflect on it for a second. The agent of change is an experience, okay? It's not a pill that's tweaking your brain day after day that you're gonna be taking for the rest of your life. It's not even a therapy and some magical stuff that a therapist can tell you or some you know, uh, information that gets passed along. It's your experience. That's why this is different. Okay, and that opens up all kinds of stuff. Because now you're outside of the, the, the diagnostic thinking. You're outside of the targeted treatment protocol thinking. And even though, you know, Rick can tell you, you know, that you, there's a lot of targeted uh, aspects to the research, and that's because it's falling under the FDA approval process. So that's a medical process. Um, so, but psychedelics don't really work like that, in my opinion. This is why they, they work for so many different issues because they're, they're operating on that humanistic source level, okay, instead of a targeted level. 
So we're only scratching the surface with regard to what psychedelics can, can help with. Now there's a place for diagnoses and the medical model, but I tell you as a therapist, and Sheree can tell you this too, that overdiagnosis is rampant. You know, we're, we're, forced to, we're forced to act in this way because of the model that's dominant, okay? We have to label any client that comes in our door if, if, gonna we're, going to, if we're going to get paid through insurance. And so, that's really, really sad, but we don't have a lot of time. So let's get to our, our initiative. To okay, he has to say Here, Here's the segue. So <laughs> in 2015, we were inspired to do an initiative, not because we were uh, impatient with the FDA process and where it was going. We have nothing but respect for the incredible work. I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for the, the, the scientists. In fact, let's give a round of applause. We have some great ones here. We have yeah, Stephen, you, we have yeah. Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And we weren't impatient. As a matter of fact, we were kind of, we were really in awe. We wanted to see where is this going to go. We wanted to watch the percolation. We wanted to see the coffee brew because we knew that it would get just right. And the time is right now where we're seeing these beautiful results of all of the work that these amazing scientists and doctors have done that have shown us that it's safe and it's effective thank for you. a large majority of the people. Yes. Again, and thank you. So why not, why do a ballot initiative? Why upset the, you know, like this is, we understood that people would be a bit uh, cautious in the, scientific, in the science world about a ballot initiative kicking up. So why would, why would we do that? Well, it's because we wanted to put this on a, what we consider a strong and proper philosophical footing. And I think I've described a little bit of that and I could go on and on, but I think it's super important that this comes into the culture on its right foundation, okay? Because if it doesn't, then symptoms pop up later on. You can correct those sy sy symptoms, but why not do our best to put it on a strong foundation? And in our communication, we've thought a lot about this and we've communicated with as many people, I mean, we go out and talk all the time and, and I love this idea of getting feedback of what's the perfect model. Um, we did our best to create that perfect model and I think we can say a little bit about that. So we, we started off on, on the journey of drafting a long uh, bill, which we can tell you a little bit about. Well, I, I'd like to share two things, and I don't even know if I, I shared this with you, but we, we came at it from two different perspectives. So we, in the West, we don't have necessarily our own tradition our own way of approaching spirit plant medicines, right? We see and have heard a lot about what's happening in South America and in Africa, but, but we have not established quite yet our own rite of passage. And we go, we travel to these other places to have these experiences that they've had for millennia because it's in here, we crave it, it's a part of what we're supposed to be searching for. That's what I think. At the same time, um, we have this beautiful science. So we wanted to bring in the, the ancestry of the medicine and we wanted to definitely highlight and bring in the science that we didn't have a thousand years ago. And I think that is how we birthed, that's the, where this language of this ballot initiative comes from, from both sides. How can we make sure that we, as Tom's talking about, fun, uh, philosophically bring this in? I think one way to just put it simply is we wanna be a step outside of the medical model for all the reasons I've described and yet retain the discipline, the code of ethics, um, the best practice standards. This is super important, folks. This is, and, and this goes all the way back through the lineage. It's all, uh, psychedelics have never been used as party fodder. They've never, there has always been structured use. And now, Cherie's talking about bringing structured use into our Western civilization in a way that makes sense to our minds and, and follows the path of evolution into, into the future here in the West. That's, I mean, this is no small stuff, okay? We appreciate decrim, we appreciate reduction of penalties, definitely should happen. And in fact, we're uh, supportive of the uh, Drug Policy Alliance who is moving forward with um, 
considering, and I think they're we're kind of in the midst of um, moving forward with a ballot initiative uh, process to decrim all drugs, Portugal style, in Oregon, and maybe a few different places. They're looking at, at that move. So our vision is, like Dave was, David was saying and Graham was saying, is decrim across the board, because decrim kicks up different issues, right? There's over-incarceration, there's uh, all this stuff around that. That's a if you're gonna go there, I think that should be comprehensive, but that our focus is on doing what we know should exist, and that is creating therapeutic access to psilocybin services, and not basing it on a medical model in which you have to be uh, diagnosed and all these things, but maintaining all the discipline and best practice standards. So that being said, let's just get to the nuts and bolts. Uh, if this is an almost 80-page initiative. We have taken every precaution to address as much as we could think of that could possibly cause harm because we're all about safety that could um, increase the stigma because we don't want to do that so here's what we are proposing we're proposing anybody over 21 without or with a diagnosis if you want to come explore your consciousness or if you actually have clinical depression or other uh, anxiety stress the existential anxiety because you've been recently diagnosed with cancer, we're proposing that you can come to Oregon to a service center, this is another part of it, where you will be administered by a licensed facilitator who could or couldn't be a psychotherapist, by the way, that will sit with you and not give you non-directive love, care, and support as you have this experience in your own way. And that's what we're, that's the heart of what we're proposing. You won't go out onto the street. You won't go even drive yourself home. So there's no fear there. But you can come and you can have a psilocybin experience for any reason, as long as you don't have a contraindication. So there will be a risk assessment done to make sure that you, it's safe for you. It's not everybody's medicine, right? And there will be a, a, a first session where you're gonna learn all about the medicine and what it does and what it doesn't do and some challenges that you may or may not experience. And then the second time you meet with your facilitator, you will actually have your full day experience. And then the third time, you're gonna come back and do the most important part which is the integration of this mystical, profound experience that you just had. That's it in a nut bolt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me thank you. Thank you. And let me just like reiterate this point that this puts it into your hands. This isn't being handed down from above. There's going to be standalone licenses that anyone can apply for. You can create a service center. You can become a facilitator, okay? You have to follow safety and best practice standards, and you have to get trained to do that. It's not willy-nilly. It's not, you know, just open it up to everything, but it's not somebody else doing it. It's you guys. That means that service centers don't have to be clinical-looking, sterile. They can look like whatever you create. There's a, a, there's a marketplace of ideas to to come into fruition, and those can happen as long as they are based on safety, practice standards, code of ethics, okay? But it can be outside, it can be a retreat center if it follows the guidelines of what, you know, that, that, that needs to be, to be safe, okay? And one other thing I'd also like to say is, well, we do question and answers, uh, but in the law that we're proposing, we made sure that we could not eliminate the natural mushroom, that it could be used during these services. So Absolutely. you could get mushroom extract, you could get synthetic, or you could use psilocybin mushrooms. We so put, that was really important to us that that part of it was there. So I, I think Graham's... Uh, They've got some questions, and I think... I think we need to make a few last points. So uh, we made every effort possible, and they're pretty rock-solid uh, defense against corporate takeover, pharma takeover. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk, but hear me, okay? This has been built for you. This has been built to eliminate big marketing. It's been built to eliminate uh, pharma influence, big corporate influence. For example, you can't own 
uh, more than one production center of mushrooms or psil synthetic psilocybin of a limited size. So what corporation is going to pick up on that? Okay, it's not, it's not rocket science. But you have to know our heart. You have to know that we're with you. We want to bring this out into the world in such a way that makes sense and is on the right footing for the culture, okay? So please spread that far and wide because this is actually a template. This is actually a template I mean, Oregon's an interesting state, and we are the tip of the spear on this one, and I'm so excited to have, the incre this is like the dream team of all time. I, like, I literally could not pick, like if I could pick anyone in the world, I would pick these two guys to work with, and I am, and it just blows my mind. So, um, we're gonna make, this is a global template. We're gonna start in Oregon, and we're going to move this across as fast as we can, and, but strategically and allocating resources in the right way. So let's get this movement together on the same page, realize that we're all working toward uh, freeing these substances and allowing healing to happen and changing and penetrating the mental health care system and ultimately the health care system at large. That's, this is, this is big stuff, okay? Thanks. All right, thank you, we're gonna uh, take a few questions. Does the passage of this initiative, will that provide for the psilocybin to be available if it's still against federal law? So psilocybin will only be available at service centers, and so there will be no, it's not like cannabis at all. You will need to go to a service center in order to receive psilocybin and the psilocybin service itself, so no. It's still a yeah, so, uh, so we, we've, one of the, so they actually pulled the petition uh, after it was really well drafted, but there were certain things that Graham and myself, or primarily Graham, uh, advised to um, refine and optimize. And one of them was the delay implementation to two years. So this contemplates setting up an, uh, an expert board with, you know, assigning certain board members representing crucial stakeholder groups uh, from the healthcare uh, uh, system, from enforcement. Uh, experts from the field, the pioneer like Steve Ross, you know that that's going to come up with the regulations for 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 licensing and screening and um, but the production will be that yeah it is in conflict with federal law but it's just like state medical marijuana is so it's all about moving the culture having a hopefully a crushing victory uh, in the context of FDA approval 2021 for MDMA just to, you know so that by the time this implements. The government feds are like, yeah, okay, this is really well thought through. This is inevitable. Well, let's go. Yeah. Right on. Right on. Next, okay, one, one more question. So a friend and I are developing a wellness center, business plan to open in Colorado, hopefully within the next three years or so, three to five years, depending on what the trajectory of this looks like. So what are... What are the barriers to commerce in including psilocybin uh, experiences as, a, as something that the public, the general public can access uh, within any non-medical decriminalized business context? So, so decriminalization does not create commerce. That's, that's kind of a confusion, I think. Um, you have to have a legal framework to create service centers, to create licensed producers, to create transactions. And that's why we have an extremely detailed bill. So that's the barrier. The barrier is to create an extremely detailed bill that lays out a framework that protects the spirit of what we're trying to do, but creates legal channels to do this. Uh, and that takes a lot. And that is really penetrating the mental health care system, okay? Um, and I think it's smart on a state level to do it that way. Again, we are, you know, we're, I think we're all interested in seeing decrim across the board. No one should go to jail or lose a job for picking a mushroom out of the ground. It's ridiculous. But if you're going to create therapeutic access, you have to have a legal framework, not a decrim framework. Um, and so on a state level, that takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of everything. Um, I think it makes sense on the city level to, to penetrate the um, city councils and whatnot and see if we can get decrim on the board. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think, and we can talk more about that in terms of what's actually in the initiative. There's a lot to talk about there. Thank you. 
So like, a, like any mycelial network, you are the spores. So I would like you to just look inside right now and think how psyched am I about what these guys are doing? How much, how much do I want to see Oregon be the first state to do this so that it can be the, then be done in your state? And what I would like you to do after you've looked inside is to raise your hand if you're going to talk to your friends, if you're going to host a house party and raise money and donate it to their campaign, spread the word. You are the spores that are the beginning of this movement. And you know, the decrim thing has more buzz right now and it's going to continue and that's all good. But this is just getting rolled out, just getting born. So, so please raise your hand if you are committed to talking to your friends, having the house party, raising money, spreading the word, and winning in November 2020. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. A lot. <laughs> Thank you. Like tears. Really, this is our baby, by the way. We don't have children together, so she's ours. So thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for the panel. We're going to wrap up the day.